Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel-powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Darren Newsom recaps the March crop report. Kate Brooks analyzes cattle markets. We show you our final interview detailing Brazil's soybean industry. And Daryl Martin discusses center pivot efficiency. Darren Newsom from DTN is our grain marketing analyst this week. The USDA Monday released its March supply and demand estimates. On the global scene, the USDA left Argentina's soybean production alone, but decreased Brazil's to 88.5 million metric tons due mainly to hot, dry weather in Brazil's south. Brazil's national supply company Conab significantly lowered its projections for the country's soybean crop, trimming the size from more than 90 million metric tons to about 85.5 million metric tons. The current estimate would be almost a 5% increase from last year and therefore still set a record. We talked with Darren at the Triumph of Ag Expo in Omaha Wednesday as the soybean market was having a hard time staying afloat. The biggest thing that I see in the soybeans right now, I know there's a lot of talk at, you know, all of this happened, you know, the USDA report this, that, and everything else. But the biggest thing that I see in soybeans right now is U.S. exports look to be coming to an end. We've had an extraordinary pace uh, through the first half of the 2013-14 marketing year. And just by how the market's selling off, where the pressure's coming from, it looks like that this door has just slammed shut on U.S. exports this week and we'll see what happens in the weeks to come. The reality is, even by the USDA's estimates, there, there just aren't that many beans left. Now, by your estimates, how many beans do you think are still left in the U.S.? Well, that's a good question. Uh, USDA, in its March report, pegged ending stocks at 145 million bushels. I still argue that they aren't accounting for all of last year's shipments, so we could actually be looking at 10 to 15, or I'm going to say about 10 million bushels less than that, so about 130, 135 million bushels. If we stay on the pace that we are right now for U.S. exports, that would actually put us into negative territory. We would, we would have you know, simply no beans left whatsoever. That's not going to happen. But I do believe the situation is tighter than the 145 million bushel. I think the market is showing us that, and it's going to take some sort of change in demand to get that to, to, to you know, finally see beans start to slow down. If uh, today and it's still Wednesday, but if this is an indication that the ship might be taking on a little bit of water here, where's the resistance? Where do you think it can find some support? The biggest thing in the, in the old crop beans is that we ran up to just over 14 and a half. I think we hit a high of 1460 here recently. The problem with a sharp run up like that, and again, based on demand, was that there's very little underneath it when that demand shuts down. So we really don't have any technical or chart support until we get down to about 13 and a half. And at that point, we're going to have to see if the buyers get interested in the market again. Brazil's CONAB today is estimating that uh, Brazil's soybean production is going to be down quite a lot from their previous estimate, from 90 all the way to about 85.4. How much impact would that have maybe here in the U.S.? Again, I, I think longer term, it's going to provide another level of support on this market because so much of what we've heard, again, as you mentioned, uh, throughout the course of the winter was 90 million metric tons of production in Brazil. If that doesn't happen now, that means we could see even more U.S. beans shipped out into the market you know, with all the other issues that are going on. So I, I find it interesting how uh, Brazilian production continues to be whittled back. The market really isn't paying attention to it again this week, but I think it will, in time, uh, take note of these reductions. 
new crop soybeans, if producers haven't maybe used the rallies already to sell off some of those, what do you think is maybe an opportunity here? I think there's still some, I think there's still some potential in the new crop soybean market. Uh, depending on what happens with December corn, depending on what happens with weather, I think the three million acre increase in soybeans that everybody's talking about after the annual outlook from USDA in February, I think that's in question. And so the soybean market may want to wait. Let's see what happens with corn. Does co Once the corn planters start going, do they keep going? Do they take some of these acres back from beans? I think that's going to provide this, this, this level of support for soybeans. Going to hold us in the upper 11s, low 12s, with a weather scare pushing us even beyond that. Does basis move or improve at all here as we go towards planting? I think so. Uh, you know, we've seen basis sag, both corn and soybeans here over the last 30 days or so. But as we get into the planting season and producers get busy, they're not going to be moving as much corn, they're not going to be moving as much soybeans out of their bins. Merchandisers are going to have to try to push that cash price and that means a stronger basis level. Let's move to old crop corn. What do you think is the trade range for old crop corn? Uh, you know, we've pushed up to near five. It seemed to be a little heavy at that point. Uh, it, cre it created a lot of cash sales. In other words, producers started selling their what was left. So I think in this 450 to 480 range market, it's going to be comfortable to sit for a while. Uh, and then as we get into spring, maybe push the upper side of that range with an occasional shot, maybe towards the five. Uh, but I just don't see it taking off and exploding right now. I think it's going to sit here for a while. What does that mean for the cash market? Cash market, I think, is going to firm. You know, right now we're seeing uh, corn somewhere around 25, 30 cents underneath, cash corn 25, 30 cents under the, under the futures. So if we hold, say, in that 25 cent level, we push up to about 480, 485, we're looking probably 460, 465 on the cash market, national average cash price. Where would you start to be a seller with more new crop? We've seen what the February average price was, so setting the guaranteed price now. And I believe it's in the 460 area, 450, 460 area. Um, so now that we're getting the market, the December corn contract back above, up into the upper fours, into the low fives, I think that's going to generate some sales because producers are going to look at that and say, look, I can make money selling corn for up around $5. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that could possibly draw more acres into the corn, uh, into corn this year. Certainly providing producers with some opportunities to make some sales. I wouldn't wait too long. You know, if we see the corn getting that high, again, we've seen it here already. Once we get up there, yeah, I think we need to start increasing our sales pace a little bit, get some on the books. Next week, we'll look at wheat markets with North Dakota State Extension Economist Frayne Olson. The Sterling Pork Profit Tracker for the week ending March 7th shows a profit level in the farrow to finish sector that hasn't been seen in more than 26 years. The tracker shows an average profit of $66.31 per head, the highest since July 11, 1987. The mark was a gain of $16.5 from a week ago and nearly $55 above the same period in 2013. Cattle prices have also provided good profit environments for farmers and ranchers. UNL Extension Livestock Economist Kate Brooks joined us Thursday morning to discuss returns in the feeding and cow-calf sectors, as well as the latest in the cash cattle markets. This week and last week, we've probably maybe seen what we'd call a plateau. You know, we saw a lot of strength in, in the fed cattle prices, maybe starting to see a slight decline now. We're talking about all-time high, so it's hard to say, you know, we, we're seeing this decline in the prices, but, you know, maybe seeing some type of plateau. As we move that into looking at the futures, into uh, the futures market, mm -hmm. we see a gap again, you know, kind of in after April, uh, the April market compared to the June market. Some of that having to do with maybe we're seeing some early placements of cattle that'll come to the market later on, um, and then maybe see some seasonal softening in the fed cattle market um, that's typical but as well seeing some of this pull forward earlier this year what do you think the uh, feeder market is, is looking like in terms of margins i mean are people making good money and have they been making good money you know we started to see the end of 2013 and then here into 14 starting to see some increases in margins mm -hmm. you know helping that margin out um, maybe seeing some profits there uh, as we continue to see increases in those fed cattle prices it's really helped them. But, 
you know, they've seen declines in input prices, but they're also paying higher prices for those feeder calves as we go forward. Yeah. What about packers? Are they making money? You know, they probably were starting to see some hurt there when they were having to pay higher right. fed cattle prices. You know, the box beef prices came down pretty quickly, um, it, but they've started to rise again here recently. And so with some maybe softening in the fed cattle prices, as well as some increases in the box beef, they might start to see a little bit of improvement in those margins. It seems like retail beef prices, at least locally here, may seem to be increasing a little bit. Uh, obviously, they've been increasing for a little while, but how severe is that increase? Yeah, you know, we saw that huge jump up in box beef prices the beginning of this year, the end of uh, January. Mm -hmm. As we moved through February, they declined, but we're back up in those box beef prices again. Uh, we haven't seen all of that hit the market, uh, so we'll probably continue to see some increases there in the retail side. If you're a cow-calf producer and uh, you have pasture locked up and you own the heifer and it's bred already, how bright could this year be? You know, there is a lot of profitability potential here uh, throughout the U.S. with the cow-calf industry. We're seeing those record high feeder calf prices, lower input prices, um, so there is a lot of potential for some profitability within the cow-calf industry. Towards the end of next uh, week on Friday, we'll get the next cattle on feed report. Do you have any expectations going into that release? You know, February last year was one of the lowest numbers we'd seen in a long time. Um, as we see this release, it, it's not going to be a surprise if placements are up this year. Uh, just following January's trend, we see a lot of pull forward coming in. Uh, so we may see a little bit higher uh, February cattle on feed numbers than maybe we saw the previous year. Um, but some of that's that pull forward we're seeing in this market right now. Again, the USDA is slated to release this month's cattle on feed report Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock. In last month's numbers, the agency showed Nebraska had more cattle on feed than any state in the nation. Now to our final interview from Brazil. We've shown you in previous weeks how Brazil has become one of the world's largest soybean growers, but noted the difficulties it faces in further increasing production. Our layover in Sao Paulo gave us time to stop at an economic consulting firm to learn more about the overall agricultural landscape across the country. Well, Brazil, it's, uh, have a very great history in agriculture, but we are uh, big t these days in grains, uh, soybean and corn, we are, corn we, are have, we are getting bigger. And we are the first uh, world producers in coffee sugar and cattle as well. Then we have, um, how can I say, we have an expertise in these things, in this stuff. And all the increase in production from 20, 30 years to now happens in the very center of Brazil, okay, with new lands, new states coming on production. How has Brazil managed to increase its bean production, or why have they? decided to increase their soybean production? I think because soybean, it's a very liquid uh, uh, grain in the world. It's very easy to, to transform soy in money. And we, how can I say, we, we managed to, 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 to develop a very, uh, a, a kind of seed that fits very well with this uh, climate and soil conditions in the center of Brazil. We did a lot of research, which was very good in, from 1960, 1970 to now, and then we became great in that. How many acres or how many hectares more could Brazil plant to crops? Well, I think we can double, easily double the, the, the amount of land you, used in, in crops because we have the, the, all the cattle in Brazil and we, we, we create them we, in a, a kind of pasture uh, 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 system and we fee we just managed to decrease a bit the all the area occupied by one cow. We can double the 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 the, the area. So the there's crops. no no limitations to the rainforest or anything N like that. Not really, because the 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 great uh, the biggest uh, cattle producers in Brazil are in the central region as well. And they are in the same uh, states, and then you can easily do this change. And it's what's a very important thing is that, in spite we we call all this area in the center as Amazon area, they are not Amazon forestry. 
we are, they are far from the, the, the Amazon forest, okay? Uh, about um, 800 and 1,000 kilometers from the Rio Amazon forestry. Then it's a kind of different um, soil and, and, and uh, climate area. It's not, it's uh, um, geographic, it's Amazon region, but it's not really Amazon. The uh, farmers in a lot of Brazil will plant two crops this year. Do you think they'll plant soybeans and soybeans again, or soybeans and then corn? I still think they are going to be soybean, they are going to plant soybean and corn. But this is an issue at the moment because some people are saying they are going to, to plant soybean again. But I think they are going to plant more corn, especially because I, I, I believe in the a kind of uh, bilateral agreement we made with China and where they are going to import more corn from us this year. This is not, how can I say, a firm uh, a very great uh, uh, call, but anyway, I'm going. I'm believing in that, and that's why the people are thinking it's going to plant more corn. And the other problem is that if you plant soybeans and soybean again, that's not good for the crop. You have a problem with all the diseases and things like that. Do many farmers in Brazil use crop insurance? Not really. It's, it's getting more common now. It used to be uh, unknown and a bit expensive, but now in order to get the low ones from the, the bank, you must have the crop insurance as well. How bad is the transportation and the infrastructure in Brazil? Really bad. That's really our, our problem in Brazil, because we, we, we increased the production going to the center of Brazil, but we didn't build the, all the infrastructure necessary to deal with that, even to storage. The, 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 the grain in there, and that make people lose a lot of money. How can it get better? Well, with uh, international investments in there. <laughs> but really, we need a, a more, how can I say, a more clear legal environment in order to get the, 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 invest, the amount of investment we need. Government's not good in that, and you are not going to put your money in a, a, a project that you don't know where it's going to, to go, okay? And that's a problem of, I think, legal environment, okay? Which is not very clear in Brazil. We How don't have the money. Yeah. We need money from abroad. How much money will farmers lose because of the transportation issues here? For example, if you get the prices of the soybean price in the port, and compare with the, what the, the producers in Mato Grosso receive, I think this is going to be 45, 50% the amount in the port. It doubled the, 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 the price. It's really, really a lot. Finally, between Brazil and the U.S., which country has the most potential in agriculture and especially soybean production in the future? Well, soybean, we are almost even. Okay, because we have the same product productivity and things like that. But I think you are in a um, higher stage than we are. Then because of this potential we are not using yet, I think we have more, more kind of, how can I say, more increase to give. You can have anyway, any time you can change a lot in terms of technology and things like that in the United States because you are, because you are really good in that. But here in Brazil, if we do just very simple things like uh, grow, uh, building roads, we are going to, to, to increase a lot. As we've mentioned in previous episodes, one of Brazil's soybean production hurdles is the long distance from the fields to a port. In Argentina, however, the opposite is true. Next week, we'll look at why the proximity of Argentina's large soybean growing region to the nearest port is a big benefit to farmers. The March Nebraska farmer asks, when the irrigation season is over, why not put your center pivot to work as a mobile fence? That's what Jason Gross, a UNL engineering technician, did when he invented the pivot fence. Gross attached an electric wire to a 1,300-foot-long pivot so it could lead cattle around a circle as part of a rotational grazing system. The pivot fence was named one of the 50 most innovative designs last year by the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers. 
This feature article and much more on agricultural news can be found in the March Nebraska Farmer. You may have had the chance in February to attend one of UNL Extension's Center Pivot Management short courses to learn more about sprinkler packages, soil water relationship, and optimum efficiency. The meetings are sponsored through a grant from the Center Pivot Industry in Nebraska and by the Nebraska Environmental Trust. We've recently discussed a few of the course topics and how farmers can tune up their systems with UNL Extension Water and Irrigation Resources Specialist Daryl Martin. Well, the first thing we suggest that they do is that it, get a thing that's called the sprinkler chart from the Pivot uh, Company. They should have one already, but if they can't find it, they can get it back from their dealer. And the first thing to do is to make sure that the right sprinklers and the right nozzles are at the right locations along the pivot. You only need to do that one time, but just make sure that things properly installed. And then once you have the right devices, um, if you operate it now early when you can see everything, just turn it on and do a diagnosis. You know, you can tell a lot about whether or not the sprinkler package is working right just by, by looking at it. Um, if you have a question, we suggest maybe you put a new pressure regulator and a new sprinkler in uh, on a couple spans and compare how the old package is doing compared to the new one. Every once in a while you'll drive down the, the road and you'll see one that is obviously not working. How costly can that be or what effect does that have on uniformity throughout the field? Well, you live with that uniformity all year, every year, that it's that way. And uh, an example is some studies that we did up in Box Butte County um, a few years back in a dry year. It looked like it might have cost the individual maybe 20 bushels the acre on the whole field because they uh, had some real non-uniformity issues in that field. And, you know, that kind of money, even with today's price of grain, uh, certainly you can pay to fix that sprinkler package almost in any case. So, Would you recommend using pressure gauges at certain points throughout the pivot? Yeah, the, the, see, the, the real secret to getting a center pivot and diagnosing whether or not the pivot's working right is to know what the pressure should be and then to monitor where that pressure is. Uh, we'd really like to see you put a pressure gauge uh, wherever your pivot panel is at where you start the, the machine. If you can read that pressure there and know what it's supposed to be, then you're pretty sure the pivot's working right. We would also encourage you to put a pressure gauge on the very far end of the machine and then to go out and observe that pressure when that, that tower or that end of the machine is up on the highest spot in the field and just make sure that you're getting enough pressure there. Give me an idea of, of why it's a good idea to match. You had mentioned this before, but why it's a good idea to match your, uh, your irrigation to the soil type that you're yeah. on. Well, the, the key issue that we want to look at with matching the sprinkler package to the soil is really to look whether or not we might have potential for water running off the field that we apply with the center pivot. And so we've developed some, um, some guides that they can use to uh, look at the, what their soil type is. We use the web soil survey that's available from the, it's a computer program available from USDA where growers can find out what soil types they have and what the slopes are. And then we have a procedure where they can very simply match to see how far the sprinkler should throw the water. And once they know that, then they can go to their manufacturer and say, you know, I need sprinklers that throw water at least as far from each side of the pivot. So it's a simple process. The Natural Resources Conservation Service also is utilizing that, that technique if you're interested in a cost share program like with Equip or something. So it, it's just critical. I think runoff is our biggest issue under standard pivots, and we, we just have to get the right sprinklers out there to avoid that. Now with his weekly weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. Before we get to the main forecast, let's take a retrospective look over this last week. And, of course, the biggest news of this entire period was the system that came through on the day on Tuesday. Really, all we've seen was some light snowfall accumulations across the northern part of the state. As that system moved toward the southeast, it lost a lot of its punch. And by the time it made it into east, central, southeast Nebraska, we've seen a brief period of snow. Uh, basically nothing but more than trace amounts on the surfaces and then the system quickly dissipated as it moved toward the southeast. Total water out of the system, but the best I seen was a tenth of an inch of liquid equivalent across the northern part of the state, more of east central and southeast Nebraska. Trace to three one hundredths of an inch was very, very common. So now once again we didn't get a lot of moisture. Now as we go through this next seven day period we got two more systems to deal with, but once again they look to be very moisture starved. So let's take a look at the upper air pattern and see what we have in stores we go through this next seven day period. First thing we'll draw your attention to is there's a trough to our west that's going to slide to the south of Nebraska. We'll catch a little bit of energy from the northwest flow with the system over the Great Lakes. That will probably generate some light precipitation across the northern part of the state as we go into this evening and that'll carry through into southeast Nebraska through tomorrow morning. Right now we're looking at less than an inch of accumulation in most locations. Might see an isolated two inch mark if we can get some 
snowfall generated, and then it will become more of a rain-snow mixture as it moves toward the southeast, and then once again, totals are going to be very light. Now, as we go into Sunday, we'll start to build some warmer air into the western part of the state. We'll stay a little bit cooler than normal across the eastern part of the state as we draw this northwest flow, but by the time we get into Monday, we'll start to see that ridge building even farther to the north. Everybody should have a well above normal day in terms of temperatures, but right again, we have another system that's going to come sliding toward the southeast Monday night into Tuesday, bringing a shot of snowfall, particularly across north central, northeast Nebraska, primarily looking at less than an inch of accumulation and lesser amounts as you move toward the south and southeast of this system. Basically just trace amounts are expected. So here we go on Tuesday, the system passes to our east. Once again, we get ridging pattern building up to the west, bringing warmer area into the south and western part of the state. So it looks to be a fairly comfortable day on Tuesday, although slightly below normal. But more importantly, we'll start to see that ridge uh, build into the entire state where we'll finally return to above normal conditions statewide. And we have another system that's going to move through the southern plains and just clips uh, this Kansas and maybe just slightly the southern part of the state, but precipitation with this looks to be almost virtually non-existent. So here we go on Thursday, the system moves through Kansas, another trough digs into the Pacific Northwest, looks to be a little bit more significant. And by the time we get to Friday, it digs down into the Southwest, really pumps a big fetch of warm air into our region. We could be looking at temperatures breaking the 80 degree mark across southwest Nebraska, but 70 is consistent across a good portion of the state. So we take a look at the temperatures as they run out through this week. You'll notice that the, we'll see a cool down as we get into Sunday, brief warm up on Monday, once again cool on Tuesday, and then a slow warm up as the week progresses. And in terms of the 8 to 14 day forecast next Tuesday through the following Tuesday, cold air starts to settle into our region and in terms of precipitation, an increase in precipitation across the northern and the southern plains. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews with Darren Newsom, Kate Brooks, and Daryl Martin, as well as our final look at Brazil's soybean industry, are available on the Market Journal website and through our mobile app as part of the March 14th episode. Next week, Frayne Olson will be our marketing analyst. We'll discuss spring soil sampling with Charles Shapiro, and George Graff will talk about some of his soybean research in Chile. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.